Thank you, Mary, and thank you to the NCPTT for uh, inviting a northern neighbor, um, even though I am from the US, but uh, talking about a Canadian context in terms of roadside architecture and uh, attractions. Um, so for my presentation, Great. I'm um, talking about the concrete jungle, um, uh, conserving Canada's menagerie of concrete sculptures. Um, these are some recent projects um, in 2017 and a current project um, for this year that CSI and our Ottawa office are, have been involved in of working with uh, municipal and universities um, for the preservation of these sort of beloved pieces um, that have become sort of the intrinsic value of, of local communities. Um, so the three main projects that I'm going to be talking about are the, uh, the Center Street Bridge Lions, um, which are located in Calgary, Alberta, um, the Maurice Savoy Mural, which is located at um, Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Denny the Dinosaur, um, also located in Calgary, Alberta, um, at the Calgary Zoo. Um, you can see here that's a heritage um, postcard from the 1950s of Calgary, downtown Calgary. Um, the Center Street Bridge is one of the main roads um, um, it's a grid system, so it's the main road. Um, rather than a main street, they have center street. Um, and the lions are actually four lions that were placed on kiosks um, through the pedestrian walkways um, leading into and out of the city. Um, and then, as ever, we found out yesterday, everyone loves dinosaurs. Um, for an example of Denny the Dinosaur um, from the Calgary Zoo, um, who was... Uh, and still is a beloved feature of the zoo, not just the live animals, um, and was readily used as advertising um, and a destination spot. This is actually um, my coworker and co-author, um, Sophia. This is actually her grandparents at their honeymoon who traveled to go see Denny as part of their trip. Um, so just a little context, I will admit, um, I've been in Canada about five years now and I, my geography of Canada was lacking. So. Um, the main projects, um, one of the biggest factors, obviously, in Canada is weather. Um, it's, you know, the great white north, and it is true. Um, most people joke, and I'm sure uh, anyone from northern states, um, there's two seasons in Canada. It's winter and construction. Um, so that does also limit the preservation um, opportunities for a lot of these outdoor artworks because your working times are very limited, especially if you're doing large scale projects like these, um, as well as the type of materials that you can use um, because freeze thaw and just sheer freezing is such a problem. Um, so St. John's all the way far, far east in the Maritimes um, and Calgary out west um, in a Western prairies. Um, the weather itself, um, both are highly windy, um, but the Calgary has a, a unique sort of feature um, referred to as the Chinook. Um, right next to the Rockies, it actually, um, in the winter, you get high shifts. So you get this weird, it'll be negative 30 degrees for two weeks, and then it will be plus 50 um, for two weeks after. So you get these quite drastic shifts that facilitate further problems with any outdoor structures um, compared to the Newfoundland maritime climate um, where it is highly windy, um, highly sunny, um, snow constantly, and this can all happen in changes of 15 minutes within one day throughout the year. Um, so because these pieces, um, which many of the ones that have been spoken about with the conference are identified as either public art or roadside art, whether it's privately owned or publicly owned, there's always this kind of balance between the conservator or the researcher, um, the public, um, because they're the ones that you're preserving this hopefully for, um, and then also the client. As we work in the private industry, there's always this balance between what are your con contractual obligations versus what advocacy should you be promoting to the public um, for the pieces that you're working on, um, and then also the public opinion to the client. Um, we found a lot of the instances, especially in Calgary, there was recently a an election cycle, um, and a an official misspoke about one of the public art pieces, um, causing a very large controversy um, just because they stated something inaccurate, um, referencing uh, one of the native communities. And as a result, there was a complete moratorium on any public artwork. Um, 
we were able to continue because we had an existing contract, luckily, with the Lions. Um, but we weren't allowed to speak about it. We weren't allowed to do any PR, any discussion with the public, anything, because it was pretty much a big no-no. Because then the public said, well, why are we spending money on things if we can't agree with it? And so it's this it's constant balance, um, but always, hopefully, the, the object at the center of it. Um, so just kind of expanding on that, um, a lot of the preservation goals um, with these outdoor sculptures um, and roadside attractions is always um, you have your ideals of what you're working towards, of wanting to do everything from historical research and getting all of your paint analysis done and doing you know material identification and historic research and photographs. And many times, like I said, your timelines are very short. Uh, the contracts don't cover that kind of information. So these projects really focused on um, just getting the work done because for the most part these were while publicly loved very neglected pieces um, and it wasn't until they became a health and safety hazards that the city and um, universities decided to do something about it so this is one of the Calgary lines. So as I said, it's one of four. Um, so the bridge itself was built in 1916 um, and designed by one of the architects that was a member um, of the city council. And the lines are designed after the lines at Trafalgar Square in London. Um, this is the time when Canada is still a British uh, entity. So this is always the connection there. Um, and the lines themselves are 13 tons, um, quite enormous, um, and were created in five separate sections. Um, so they were cast around a cage of internal rebar and then set in sections, as you can see here, um, on top of the bridge. Um, and then you sort of, these little kiosks you can walk through and under. Um, after that point when they were installed, then they had local sculptors come in and apply sort of like a shelter coat um, to add in additional details for the main and the faces um, to kind of get a little bit more dimension to the lions. Um, and the idea was then sort of protect the base concrete um, that was sort of still the same kind of concrete that was used as part of the bridge. Um, so these had to be structurally integral um, as they sort of, you know, several feet up in the air and hanging over passerbys. Um, so, unfortunately, um, there was very little that was done for these objects um, over their numerous years um, in Calgary and the extreme weather. Um, so, in the late 80s, um, it was decided, one, they were widening the bridge, um, and two, they realized that there was... Um, work that needed to be done. Uh, so some campaigns, unfortunately, there are no records of what was done. Um, acrylic coatings were applied uh, to the concrete, likely because they were spalling um, and just general deterioration over time. Um, these coatings have had an adverse effect to the lions. Um, so after 10 years of that, they did another round of construction on the bridge and the decision was made to actually remove them in 1999 um, because they were pieces falling off, uh, they were found not to be structurally stable, um, but because of the link with the community and they had such a presence, they replaced the lions with new casts, but the city saw that this as an opportunity to preserve the existing ones and it became absorbed in part of the public art program um, that is sort of widespread throughout Calgary. So you can see here, um, Basically, the, the four of the lions were all taken off, sent to sort of lion graveyard on the top of a hill, um, and three of them had been sitting there since 1999. Um, they did decide to preserve one of them um, and put it in front of City Hall as sort of an emblem um, of the sort of connection um, between the street itself um, and the City Hall, which is one block over. Um, what they ended up doing with the treatments, as you can see here, the amount of cracking um, that is throughout uh, the structures, especially along the seam lines, um, there is no, while there is an internal rebar, there is no structural um, ties between all the different pieces. So as the rebar, which they found um, to be almost 100% corroded um, and non-existent um, through ground penetrating radar and radiography uh, sampling, um, it's, there was not much holding it together outside of just the cohesion of the of the concrete mix. Um, 
when they removed them, they did include. They did have to take part of the bridge with it. Um, so you can see in the the photos on the right, the sort of stepped section with the core holes is where they drilled through it to remove it uh, from the bridge, and then installed. Um, uh, HSS steel framing uh, to support it and allow for transport. Um, so in 2017, um, in sort of the centennial of the creation of the bridge, the city decided that they were going to preserve the second lion, um, but take a different approach with it. Um, it was going to be displayed in a public park overlooking the bridge to sort of have this connection between the original and the old and the replacements. Um, and the originals as well. So, however, the decision by the city officials was they wanted it to be conserved as a ruin, uh, whereas the one in City Hall um, was more a restoration approach. Um, they wanted to illustrate the life of the lions, so they wanted the cracks to be seen. They wanted all the bumps and bruises, sort of warts and all um, approach. Um, so as part of our assessments, um, we took that into consideration in choosing our treatment methods. Um, so our second case, case study was the Maurice Savoy um, mural, which is a large scale um, mural on the side of Memorial University. It's um, 12 large scale decorative panels uh, that is a combination of cementitious mortar on a concrete backing um, that is structurally hung on the side of the building. It dates to 1966, um, and Maurice Savoy was a famous Quebecois um, ceramicist. So while there's a lot of research about his ceramic work, if anyone's been to Montreal, he did a lot of the murals in the Montreal tube station, or uh, subway stations, um, and but unfortunately, for whatever reason, there is no record of him ever using a cementitious or concrete medium. Um, there are no records of why on earth this thing ended up in Newfoundland. Um, we, the university has very little records, um, but basically it was put up there in 1966 and it's not been touched since. Um, so as you can see, um, there is a lot of large scale loss um, as a result of the corroding rebar, um, popping pieces off, and recently some pieces had sort of fallen into the walkways um, underneath uh, at the university, so it was deemed a health and safety hazard. Um, so one of the other issues that the client had to decide was the building needed a full restoration, it's got a lot of leaking windows, it's got a leaking roof, um, but what do you preserve, the standing building or the artwork? Um, and it came down to the health and safety needs that they actually preserved the artwork over the building. Um, so a lot of the conditions, very typical of concrete and cementitious materials, um, exposed and expanding rebar, um, with this mural specifically, you can see on the far right, um, the two separate layers, um, the outer section of the cementitious mortar um, which would have been made in a mold. Um, they would have pressed it into the mold. Um, he added in additional aggregates and colors um, sort of to get these shapes and figures. Um, and then the concrete backing, which has sort of a large mix aggregate, would have been poured on top of that um, with a layer of embedded um, reinforcing steel in between. However, probably when making it, um, the rebar sunk. So in instances, the rebar is actually protruding through the surface or within a quarter to a quarter to a sixteenth of an inch from the face. Um, so that's caused some serious problems. Um, and also, all of the caulking had failed. Um, it likely had been replaced at some point, but like I said, there were no records um, existing. Um, so one of the big things that we looked at is doing full condition assessments to understand um, the extent of the damage um, and find all of the loss and all of the voids, whether it was a visual loss um, or there were voids behind the surface, um, so we were able to address these problems. Um, but one of the biggest factors um, was addressing the biological growth. Um, the climate in Newfoundland, as I said, it's very damp um, and it, Temperatures vary throughout the year, so it was sort of a perfect climate um, and perfect surface for this type of problem. Um, so as a result, there was very extensive biological growth over the entire mural. Um, 
obscuring a lot of the details, um, which is sort of a wetland scene of crane-like birds, um, reeds, plants, um, typical of sort of like the marshlands, we're assuming, that he might have drawn from of the, the nearby environment. Um, the, the other aspects that he used, um, he did embedded um, pebbles, crushed pebbles, and actually slate and terracotta uh, into the, uh, the mural, so it actually expand, extends out from it um, to give a more depth and dimension, and then used a secondary, highly pigmented mortar, um, sort of like splatter painting with bright greens and bright red um, throughout, the, throughout the mural. Um, but unfortunately, the biological growth had sort of leached onto that. Um, so trying to find the solution of, do you get rid of the pigment or do you get rid of the biogrowth? Um, so through our work, we did um, a lot of color matching um, and mortar samples so we could find a, a comparable match for the work um, of sourcing, sourcing local sand, sourcing lo local stones um, for the replacements um, prior to us starting all of our work. Um, so the most exciting of it is another dinosaur. Um, so Denny the dinosaur, um, similar to the ones that were talked about yesterday, um, it is from the 1930s. Um, it's a large scale concrete dinosaur located at the Calgary Zoo. Um, it was actually one of 56 um, created by a local artist um, for the sort of prehistoric park. Um, Similar to the Midwest um, and the US, the dinosaur and oil is what Alberta is known for. Um, so this was a, a very big local attraction um, for Calgary. Unfortunately, um, in the 80s and through the time period, most of the collection of 56 dinosaurs were either removed or demolished. Um, and the only original one still standing at the zoo is Denny. Um, however, there is a new prehistoric park separate from Denny um, that is a fiberglass dinosaur that has sort of um, virtual walkthroughs for children and groups. Um, so there's a little bit of a disassociation that Denny unfortunately is now sitting alone by himself, um, tucked away. Um, and then also with, um, there's been a lot of rejuvenation with the zoo, um, mainly because um, pandas are coming um, from China, um, which spurns the need to do something with Denny. Um, there has been a lot of, similar to the concrete, there's been cracking, there's been peeling of the paint um, that has resulted in health and safety concerns, so they've had to block off the area. Um, the other aspect is he's now blocked off by a new road that was added in um, to the zoo uh, for better parking and access. Um, so it used to be that you could sort of this landscape that he would sort of appear out of nowhere as you turn a corner, but now he's sort of blocked off of the road actually prohibiting access, um, sort of opposite of everything else. Um, and we do know that he's been painted multiple times over the years, um, but outside of regular maintenance of general washing from the zoo staff, um, little has been done. Um, he's also located directly next to an animal pen, um, so there's that extra layer of now there's bits falling off. So it's not only just a hazard to people, it's a hazard to the animals. Um, and there's the likelihood, which we'll be doing analysis to confirm if there is lead paint, um, also if there's asbestos. Um, asbestos was used widely in anything and everything in Canada. Um, it was quarried there, um, and a lot of times it was actually mixed with cement um, to make it more ductile. Um, and provide a little bit more stability. So we'll be confirming that um, and then evaluating how do we actually treat it if you have that amount of um, hazardous materials on a piece that's that big um, next to animals. Um, so we also carried out the treatments um, on the line following our sort of review with the city to evaluate how do you preserve this as a ruin, but knowing that it's going to an outdoor back to an outdoor environment, um, that it's gonna be climbed on. It's gonna be likely vandalized. Um, it's gonna be in a public park that's not regularly monitored, typical of any type of outdoor public art, roadside attractions. There's only so much you can control. Um, so what we ended up doing is focusing on the structural repairs as well as uh, repairs to cracks, voids, losses, um, to prevent further water infiltration uh, into the monument. Um, 
so we looked at the different sections, knowing that some repair work had been done when it was removed. Um, gigantic uh, steel staples were added into the neck um, to secure the head, um, but no work was done to the sort of skirt um, plinth that was underneath it, which was actually in multiple different sections. Um, so it's likely that the line itself, while it was cast in five pieces, this sort of plinth around it was then added based on the dimensions of the, of the um, the, the kiosk that it sat on. So as a result, all the lines are just a little off. Um, it's not actually square and plumb, um, which you would think something that's engineered for a bridge would be, but it wasn't. Um, so we actually did structural reinforcement with Centec anchors um, to tie those pieces together. Um, and the highly um, fragile and corroded rebar that was in the portion of the bridge was actually all saw cut and removed and um, it's gonna be reincorporated to the new design of the new store, the um, new display sort of platform that um, is being designed for it. Uh, then we also did extensive crack repairs, um, some of which were actually through cracks. Um, work that had been done, uh, the client had hired a, an artist to repair the artworks who had done the restoration for the other lion. Um, and while, it's great that they hired someone to do the work. Unfortunately, that person didn't have a full understanding of the best options. So um, a lot of the crack repairs were only filling the surface. And once those were removed, we realized that some of these cracks were actually, you know, half a foot deep. Um, so we applied water repellent coatings and mineral pigmented coatings um, by Kime um, to allow breathability of the surface, um, as well as providing a protective coating and a sort of slightly uniform color. Um, as I said, the client wanted it conserved as a ruin, um, so they, want, they didn't want an opaque surface um, or a painted looking surface, um, so they wanted it to look 100 years old. Um, so we sort of worked with them to find a, a happy medium of enough protection versus what aesthetic they were going for. Um, for the cleaning, for removal of the acrylic coating, we ended up doing uh, CO2 uh, cleaning because the abrasive methods we knew would be a little, um, too mu it would be too much based on what they had done with the previous line. Um, so as I noted with the, with the uh, Marie Savoy mural, um, the bio growth was the largest thing of just cleaning it, um, was the biggest thing. Um, so you can see on the left, um, the bio growth, and then on the right, after cleaning. Um, we also did similar repairs of cracks and repairs to walls. Um, as I noted, the exposed rebar um, was causing areas to spall off, um, which required removal. Um, so where exposed rebar um, was visible, it was either cleaned or cut off and coated. Um, and then new repairs um, color matched and placed um, sorry, place, um, color matched and repaired. Um, as you can see in the bottom right, um, there were several uh, light fixtures that had been drilled into the piece uh, over the years, uh, resulting in numerous holes, um, plastic plugs, kind of a little bit of utilitarian approach um, to electrical work. Um, so as a result, we sort of had to faux finish it, um, in essence, to get to the, the seam lines and everything uh, to disappear as much as possible. Um, and then did a similar approach of applying a water repellent um, and corrosion inhibitors um, to prevent future deterioration, um, really focusing with the client that maintenance for these pieces was gonna be a, a huge aspect. Um, so our work with Denny has not started yet, um, but hopefully the biggest factor, as I said, is gonna be the health and safety of evaluating how do we safely remove if there is lead paint um, and remove all the failed materials um, while safely, not just for the workers, but for the animals and the public, um, as there will be a gigantically huge influx of people um, to the area. As you can see, there is a large hole that was cut into the center of him. Um, in 2008, the structural engineers came in and did reviews to make sure that he wasn't gonna completely collapse on the public's head um, and found that structural reinforcements are required um, in his neck. Um, there's no internal supports. Um, it is just the actual just frame 
that's there. Um, there was, luckily, with their, the cutting the hole in the examination in 2008, um, removed a long-standing theory that there was a Model T inside of him. Where that came from, it's unknown, seeing that he was made in the 1930s. Um, but unsure. But it's there's not one in there. It wouldn't fit anyway. Um, so as I noted, like one of the biggest things, while the treatment programs were a definite requirement to fix the health and safety concerns, as well as get these to a stable state that they can be returned to their former glory and displayed and enjoyed by the public, um, is really ensuring that maintenance and monitoring programs are part of the treatment program um, and ensuring that not only that there's awareness for that with the public, um, but explaining to the client and the public that you've got to set aside money for that. Um, this is a, if you want to keep this stuff, you, you have to keep working on it, um, which I'm sure all of you deal with it on a daily basis. Um, so one of the things, the lion is actually, um, while it was fortunately supposed to be removed last year due to the sort of controversy, the work was delayed and it is now being installed this summer, fingers crossed, um, to its new location. Um, an example of, of the new um, sort of concrete structure that it's gonna be put on and sort of watching over the new lions. Um, uh, same with the, the mural. Um, one of the big factors was because the failed caulking um, had allowed a lot of water to get in between the different panels um, and sort of just sucking it into that mural and then just the, the rebar was just highly um, corroding. Um, so try to enforce that even though access to a lot of these large scale pieces is very difficult um, and time consuming and expensive that this regular, mo regular monitoring um, will reduce large scale problems down the road in the hopes that fix a little bit now so you don't have to fix everything or risk full dismantle and demolition later down the road. Um, so with Denny, we'll see how it goes. Um, as I said, they, they have been washing uh, some of the other dinosaurs in the park, so we hope that they will be able to do some type of maintenance with Denny down the road, but because there is that sort of intrinsic, you know, community aspect with Denny of, of this um, love for him for as all children love dinosaurs of, do you let people climb on it? Do you not? I mean, hopefully once lead paint's removed, it can be. Don't eat the paint. Um, but it's also the idea that um, now that he's completely separated from his original context and all the other dinosaurs are elsewhere in the park, how do you fit that in the narrative of, is he still advertisement for the zoo, or is he just, oh, that thing that sits over there? Um, so that's what we're sort of hoping with the, hoping working with the zoo, doing advocacy and possibly um, public resources in terms of crowdfunding um, to have a little bit more of a new, renewed campaign and new love for the new generation for Denny. So yes, so thank you very much. And do we have our first question for Kelly? Drop by this today. Well, I have a question for sure. you. I actually have two questions okay. for you. The first one is, did you use any type of biocidal cleaner when you removed biological growth? We did. We used D2. D2. Yeah. And the second question I have for you is, can you tell me a little more about your CO2 cleaning? Sure. Um, so CO2 is um, basically using dry ice um, in tiny little pellets uh, that is attached to a gigantic air compressor. Um, luckily for the lion, um, the city provided a space for this to be worked on. Um, and we were, um, it was sort of like a large warehouse garage space. Um, so pretty much the, the action of the CO2 is it shock freezes the coating um, and through thermal expansion then sort of blasts it off the surface. Um, aside from the adverse effects of the abrasive cleaning that was previously used on the other lion, um, the CO2, you have a lot less to almost no residual cleanup um, because it sort of, not like a laser where it vaporizes it off the surface, but it, it almost does. Um, so it was a lot sort of safer and more manageable treatment for cleaning. Right, and that, that leads me to the last question. Did you, did you try any laser cleaning tests? We didn't try laser cleaning. Um, while we, we do do laser cleaning, um, our, 
the options for it, everything was beige. Um, so the absorption rates for the laser vary um, because of the, the, well, I won't get super technical, but basically it's not dark enough that laser would have worked. <laughs> right, you need, a, you need a contrast in the original surface to the coating. Exactly, yeah. The, the, the acrylic coating was the weird cream color, that cream gray, but there was also, the coating wasn't uniform there were random blobs of epoxy that had been dripped on it. There was old core holes that had been filled with we didn't know what. Um, there was a very miscellaneous history of, of these once they came off the bridge in 99. Um, the other two are still sitting um, in that sort of lion, you know, outdoor sculpture graveyard that the city owns. Um, that the one was used as a guinea pig um, to sort of do all the testing on one and then the one that was in best condition went to City Hall. The one that we worked on was sort of the next one. And then there's the third one and the guinea pig that are, what do you, what do, you do? Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you, Kelly.